Testing, check, check. One, two, three. Testing. Testing. Hello and welcome to the Ninja Robot Studio LLC stream where I play video games and VR experiences and talk through them from a UX designer's perspective. Game development has a heavy and direct influence on XR development so it makes sense that we would study game design and to give us a greater understanding of how to design these quality immersive experiences. And the plan is to have all of you in chat participate and that way we can all learn together. And there are already a lot of classes out there around UX design and UX processes, and more and more classes are coming out around designing for XR. And I think of this stream as kind of an unofficial and less academic and less expensive university labs class for UX for XR. And we're going to use critical thinking in our design analysis and my goal is to help you gain practical experience in this method as you participate in the chat. And check out the widgets on my Twitch page. You can see them right now, right here, Rose Thorn Bud. And we'll be using this method uh, each session to think through the games I play. And it is experimental and I will learn and iterate on this format as I go and as you guys and gals participate in the chat. So each week, for the last few weeks, the last five weeks, um, we have been going through talking about gaming misconceptions, gaming UX misconceptions. And we've been using this book um, by Celia Hoden, The Gamer's Brain, by Celia Hoden as a textbook to help us study and learn. Um, so today we are going to be talking about uh, the misconception number five, that there's not enough time or money to consider UX. And also real quick on a um, housekeeping, I'm trying a new microphone here. So give me feedback. Let me know how is the sound? Um, is it better? Is it worse? I am trying to make the sound better for you. I have sensitive hearing, so everything's loud to me. But then other people say, hey, this is too quiet. So I need y'all's help to help me figure out whether or not this sounds good, because to me it's very loud. So let me know, um, give me feedback, and help me to make this better for you guys so you can actually hear what I'm saying. Um, so first, a quick quick recap of what we have covered on the gaming, misconce gaming UX misconceptions is UX will distort the design intents and make the game easier. And the whole point of UX is precisely to help the developers accomplish their vision, certainly not to distort the design intent. And if the UX practitioner is a good UX practitioner and know what they're doing, then they're going to be, they're not going to have any kind of agenda of their own. They're going to be completely for the gamer so that the gamer can enjoy the experience. And Distorting the design intent doesn't necessarily solve that problem of letting the gamer enjoy the game. So we want to, we work together with game developers to make sure that it is 
an enjoyable game, that it's a good game, that it's easy to use and that the interface doesn't get in the way of enjoying the game. And that's what we want. And we'll be going over the pillars of gaming UX in a minute from, again, from her book. Um, but that is misconception number one. We are here to help. We come in peace. Um, the misconception number two is that UX will restrict the creativity of the team. And again, um, this is a misconception. I, she mentions here in the book, Pablo Picasso, he never went through a UX process with his art. That's one of the, um, arguments that people make about that. But if you know Picasso and if you study art history, which I did in college, went to the art Institute. So of course I'm going to learn about art. Um, they actually, there is a science to art as well. There is a science to that. And there is a science to making things look beautiful. It's the symmetry, the asymmetry, there is balance. And so you need to understand these things and know these things, the art of the science of perspective, creating a good perspective drawing for, uh, uh foreshortening, I forgot the word for a second and all those things. Um, to give that sense of depth and perception in art is a science and you can tell when things are off. Um, uh, but a good artist knows when they can break the rules and Picasso knew when he could break the rules because he knew the rules inside and out. So it's the same thing for UX. He had constraints that he had to work in and that opened up his creativity to create some really awesome things and it's the same with UX we're not here to make to stifle creativity constraints enable greater creativity and the enemy of art is let's see this is Orson Welles who's the famous filmmaker said this is a quote the enemy of art is the absence of limitations ux practitioners won't hamper the team's creativity they will simply reveal more constraints that artists have to take into account for example human mind limitations and let those additional limitations stimulate your creativity even more a greater creativity and greater innovation comes through those constraints and the world would be, would be pretty boring without constraints and um, Kim Libreri from Epic Games, she's Chief Technology Officer at Epic Games, has a, has a little essay in the book. I highly recommend the book. Um, UX analysis gives us the tools to have an unbiased scientific view of how our consumers are reacting to our product. And it has proven to be a reliable and mostly frictionless mechanism for fine-tuning content. Now, this does have to do with how we work together. And I'm actually doing a talk next week I won't be doing this stream next week. I'll be doing a talk next week, next week with Circuit Stream. I am an instructor at Circuit Stream, teaching UX there, and we'll be doing a talk next week on UX designers and XR developers working together as a team. How does that work? How does that happen? And we'll be talking about processes. We'll be talking about the value of UX, which is another one of the common misconceptions. This one we're going over today is that there's not enough time or money to consider UX. I'll actually be talking about that next, next week in the circuit stream talk that I'm doing. So if you get a chance, check that out. I don't have a link to it, but you go to circuitstream.com. Um, I don't know if the info's up yet. Um, I don't think it's up yet, but we will be doing a talk next week about that. And then misconception number three is UX is yet another opinion. And but that's because what they're saying is that developers are getting opinions thrown at them from everywhere. And this is true in game development. You've got bosses, you've got coworkers, you've got players all throwing opinions. And opinions are different from making sure that it's a great user experience. Um, but the you've got all kinds of people throwing opinions out. And what we're wanting is unbiased feedback so if it's presented correctly ux feedback is the least biased of all the feedback originating from the various channels while also being the most neutral as long as ux practitioners know where they stand and have a clear understanding of the design and business goals 
they should be the ones providing the most objective feedback. And I want to clarify about the user opinions, the gamer opinions. Now, there is a difference in um, usability. People have all kinds of opinion, even the gamers. And what you want to do is you want to get past the opinions uh, to the meat of the research. There's a way of doing that to get past these biased opinions. Uh, individual opinions don't make as much of a difference as the whole. And I'm doing a terrible job of explaining this in a way that makes sense. Um, for example, visual design. A lot of people, in, including the users, the gamers, will say, there's all that white space there. There's plenty of room for more stuff. But as a designer, you know that that's not necessarily a good thing to fill in all the white space that actually makes it harder to understand it makes it harder to comprehend so that's what i mean by users giving their own opinions that's not necessarily their opinion isn't necessarily what they really need and so we need to be careful when we're taking feedback from our users and that's why ux is so important in that process is to get past that and help discern what should and shouldn't be done what would be a good idea what would not be a good idea um, so there's a difference in getting opinions from your players and studying their behaviors to see what they really need. That's what I was trying to get at. I was just not saying it very well. Um, and then misconception number four was UX is just common sense. And actually this is not the case at all. It is a science and, um, most UX recommendations are not common sense at all. Uh, a lot of stuff is 2020 hindsight after the game's already been put out. We'll say, oh, well, why did you miss that? That's just common sense. Actually, there's a lot more to it than that. And if we, the you're not on the project, you're not working on the project, because we're so busy, there are things that can be missed and that's where UX can help. With that, they can help with the usability testing, that if it, the usability testing had happened early and often, that would have been caught sooner before the game was released. 2020 hindsight is a very common thing, but that in reality is not in the moment the case. And so UX methodologies should, methodologies should also help you find where the problems come from so that you can solve the correct problem. As Don Norman pointed out in 2013, problems usually don't reveal themselves in neat packages. They have to be discovered. So now today we're going to go over the last misconception that she has written about in this book, which is number five, there's not enough time or money to consider UX. And making games is hard. And very often, developers don't have enough resources, whether it's time, money, or people, to ship the game that they want to ship on their deadline. They either have to work overtime and end up cutting a lot of features, and or they have to sacrifice the game quality. In a 2015 press release, the International Game Developers Association revealed that 62% of game developers work overtime and that nearly half of these professionals crunching are working more than 60 hours per week. On top of this, developing and marketing games is very expensive. This is why adopting a new process and hiring new people can be perceived as adding more complications. And however, investing in a UX process is exactly that, an investment. Shipping a game with critical UX issues could end up being extremely damaging to your game, especially given that your audience can choose to spend their time and money on many other games that are now on the market competing with your game. Sometimes even a small usability issue affecting players' shopping flow when they're interacting with the game store interface can have a dramatic impact on your revenue. Most studios realize through quality assurance utilize thorough quality assurance testing so that the most critical bugs can be fixed before their games are launched. And similarly, considering the user experience 
that your game offers will help you identify and fix the most critical issues that could impact your players and in turn impact the success of your game. Moreover, if you plan for a UX process within your iteration pipeline early in the development cycle, and I talk about this often, it will help you identify issues as soon as you have paper or interactive prototypes, allowing you to fix these issues in a significantly cheaper and quicker manner than when the features are already implemented in the game engine. As for the features implemented, it will also be cheaper for you to change elements in the game before they are fully arted up and polished. Of course, not everything can be tested via prototypes, and some game systems can only be tested efficiently in a closed beta stage. But the more issues you can take down early on, the more time you'll have to focus on systemic and game balancing issues later in the development cycle. Don't ask yourself if you can afford to consider UX. Ask yourself if you can afford not to. And that is very, very, very true. And I do talk about that in the article on my website called Calculating the Value of UX for XR. And I will put the link in the show notes and in the chat if I can get the chat. Let's see if it worked for me. Um, if you visit my website, the link is on the Twitch about section and it is also here in the chat. This is the, you can check out the article, it's under UX Playbook, Calculating the Value of UX for XR. And in here I talk about, um, I don't reinvent the wheel by rewriting the whole story because there's this great video by Susan Weinschenk, and sorry if I mispronounced her name, that um, talks about the value of UX and that this study that IEEE did and the too long didn't read recap version of that is that the three of the top 12 reasons that projects fail are directly related to UX. Badly defined requirements, stakeholder politics, poor communication among customers, developers, and users, and UX methods can help with that. User research, stakeholder interviews, usability testing, and the entire UX design process being put in there from the beginning will help all of these issues. And the numbers on that are pretty staggering is that UX designer can reduce the amount of time developers have to uh, spend on avoidable, avoidable rework is up to 50% if you have a UX designer on your team. Who knows what they're doing? And if you re and it can also reduce development time overall by between 33 and 50%. And that is by helping you improve your decision making and doing that uh, that upfront paper prototyping testing uh, or or digital prototyping testing before you start coding, before you start putting all that effort on artwork and environmental design into it, you can do early testing and there's a process to that and a method to that that UX designers can help with. And that's one of the things that, one of the reasons that we play these games is to learn from them, to learn what did they do well, what, did the, what didn't go so well, how can we learn from that and make it better in our own games. And um, the ROI of that, the return on investment of that, is that every dollar invested in UX brings in a hundred dollar return on investment in time, in saving on time of development, rework, later, and also the issues that come out that can affect whether or not your game sells and stays engageable later. And we'll talk about the pillars of UX in a moment, but. I am doing a talk next week on Circuit Stream. I don't think it's out yet. I don't think the info's out yet. Nope, it's the info's not out yet, I don't think. So, um, yeah, because they're doing this one. So, it will be out soon. But I will be doing a talk next Thursday at 12, I think it's at 12 Pacific 
time. I'm not sure. I need to double check. But the info will be out soon. I will be posting it on LinkedIn for sure. So make sure you're following me on LinkedIn if you're not already. And you'll get that info for next week where I talk about how UX designers and XR developers work together, the value of XR, that whole process of how what it looks like when you implement UX from the beginning of the process. What does that look like and how do you and advice for working together with developers? Because uh, there can often be um, if there can be some tension between UX developers and UX designers, and I'm going to give some advice on how to work through that because I'm coming from experience because I spent many years with headbutting with developers and I finally learned there's a better way to do it. And I'm sharing that with you guys next week instead of this stream, I will be doing that. And then we'll be picking up again the next week. I might be testing different times of the day. I'm probably going to test a little bit later for a few weeks to see if that's better for people to see if people can come live if it's a little bit later. Um, but I also have to balance my own life and schedule. So we'll see. And I'll give it a test and go and see how it does. And if not, we'll be back to this normal time after that. But pay attention to that. Stay tuned for that. And Again, next week is a workshop with Circuit Stream instead of this normal stream. And then this is our last platformer that we're a 2D platformer that we're going to be playing this in this little series that I'm doing on platformers. And this is a retro game that we're going to be playing today, retro style game that we're going to be playing today because we don't want to forget the retro games. They started everything. Um, so we'll be looking at that and then when when we get back from that little week jump from uh, me not doing the stream next week we'll get into vr and I'll, I'll be doing some vr platformers at that point so look forward to that so every week before we get into our game we remind ourselves of these pillars of gaming ux because this is what we want to be thinking about as we play the game so let me quickly go through them again this is for my own review and for everyone's review as well. Um, these pillars of gaming UX are from, again, from the book, The Gamer's Brain by Celia Hodent, uh, that the usability, pillars of usability, there are seven, and these are based on your normal Nielsen heuristics that if you are from a UX design background or if you are on a product development team and you have been a part of heuristic evaluations or you've seen them done before, that's what this is. This is based on those, but with the mindset of gaming. And then they, she also added three pillars of engageability because this is gaming and it is for entertainment. And so the motivation of people buying and playing your game is going to be different than it would be for a traditional 2D application or a website task-based, anything like that, because there are so many other games out there that they can be entertained by. Why do they want to play yours? What makes yours better? And that's another thing to think about when you're thinking about the UX, because if there's bad UX, there's going to be some rage quitting. I've done it. And then I tell everyone else I rage quit it, quit the game, and you don't want that. Um, we have seen some recent major fallouts of poor UX in gaming, in the gaming industry lately, especially with World of Warcraft and their whole customer experience and many other games. You'll see that there's this huge influx of interest in a game and then people play it and then it suddenly disappears off the planet and you don't hear about it anymore. Um, so we don't want that. We want the, the hype to continue. Like Half-Life Alex is still going strong after all this time. There's reason for that. Final Fantasy 14. After 10 years, it just broke records on sales. Uh, so you want to continue that. That's through customer experience and good UX. And uh, now there are some usability issues with the game, but they're not so much so that it's going to hinder you from enjoying the game. So Seven pillars of usability are signs and feedback, 
clarity, form follows function, consistency, minimum workload, error prevention and recovery, and flexibility. And again, I do want you guys to feel free to participate in the chat. That's the whole point. I want you guys to learn as well and participate as well, especially when we get to the end, when we start doing the rose thorn bud exercise. And after that, we're going to talk about transitioning into or translating this game into XR. How do we do that? I definitely want you guys to participate that. If you are watching live, definitely. If you're watching this later on demand on YouTube, put it, put your participate in the comments and I do check those and I will respond as soon as I can to those. So that is another way to participate in this if you can't watch live. And again, I'm going to try different time times of the day and see if those work better for people or not. So signs and feedback are all of those visual audio haptic cues and so forth that give you signs that let you know there's there's something to be done um inform you about what's going on in the game they encourage you to execute a certain action interact with something those are your signs and then your feedback is what happens when you interact with that thing is it giving you a clear enough feedback saying this worked this didn't work there should be some kind of feedback that you have done this thing successfully, unsuccessfully, can't do it yet, or so forth. And that is science and feedback. And all of those, all of the features and possible interaction in a game should have science and feedback associated with them because they guide the players throughout the experience to help them know what's going on. Um, that is very important. And clarity is talking about all of those signs and feedback that we just mentioned should be understandable and clear and perceivable. Uh, you should be able to quickly prioritize the information that you're seeing. All of that feedback and all of those signs should be quickly able to prioritize those and realize what is currently relevant and what's currently not relevant. And you also want to think about that when you're designing your interface is you want to have think about contextual relevancy and not throw everything at them all of the time. That's one of the biggest problems I have with some of the MMOs out there is that they throw everything at you all at once. And it's not conceptual or contextual. It's just all there all the time. And so I end up customizing my screens most of the time. Um, maybe they do that with that intent in mind that they know that the heavier players are going to do that, but not everyone knows how to do that. Not everyone's going to do that. They may just be completely turned off and stop playing your game. So it would be better for you to just think through your interface more smartly and and uh, UX can help with that. Um, typography, color contrast, font usage, UI design, all of these things are require clarity um, and, and they should be perceptible and not intrusive. So you don't want them to intrude on the gameplay. Uh, you want them to help, not hinder. And then form follows function is that's talking about the design of the thing, the item, the character, the icon and so forth should convey accurately its function. And this is thinking about affordances. So this handle on this cup that I'm holding right here affords, this is how you hold this cup. Um, that means I can pick it up by this handle comfortably. And a chair affords sitting, a doorknob affords turning, and so forth. So you know what's going to happen by the design of the thing. And it should intuitively inform you how to interact with it. And we want that with our interfaces and our game interactions as well. And consistency is that there are certain consistencies in player expectations that we should follow. And this is where we need to study the players and the signs, the feedback, the controls, the interface, the menu navigation, the world rules, the overall conventions should all be consistent, not for consistency's sake, because sometimes it does need to be different for a specific reason, but we, that takes knowledge and know-how and the UX designer should be able to help you figure those things out but that should be your gaming mental models, your regional controls, all of these things. So there are certain types of games. That's why I'm playing games by genre. I did play tabletop card games 
uh, tabletop RPG and tabletop card games as my previous genre. And there were certain mental models that we found in that as we were playing the different games. And it's the same thing that we're seeing here with the platformer games as we play through different platformer games of different time times. And then we've, we've been playing desktop 2D games or desktop games, and we're going to be playing VR games after the week break. Uh, we're going to switch to VR. And so we're going to see certain things that follow through on all of these platformer games. So those are the mental, mental models, the expectations that the users have for how a platformer game should work or how a tabletop RPG should work. There are certain mental models there and we want to know those. We want to understand those. But in, on top of that, we also want to understand the regional mental models for things because we have different cultures and so there are differences in the games in the well-designed games based on region or if you just study the local games you can see that as well and the one that we're playing today is a japanese game made for japan it was never intended to be brought over here it was brought over here later and we will see some of the complications from that but for the most part um we, yeah, so we'll be learning about that today for sure. Um, but I like to always talk about even the controllers are different and we'll see that too, is that um, regionally in Japan, um, so I use the Sony controller, which is shapes instead of letters, which is actually brilliant once you think about it, because then that you're not having to deal with alphabets at that point, you're dealing with shapes and, every, and that's international. And, but the thing, there is something that's not international about the shapes is meaning of X and, of the X and the circle. Those have different meanings in different countries. So this circle in America is used for the back button for most of the games that are made in America. And the X is used for selecting things for most of the games in America. But in Japan, it's opposite. And the circle is used to select most things in Japan and the X is for the back button for most of the things. So it's opposite. So when you pick up a, in either side of it, if the Japanese pick up an American game, they're going to have to mentally switch and their muscle memory is already set on one thing because they're used to playing their own games. Unless, of course, they started playing another region. Um, their mental models are going to be set for their region. And then if they throw in one from another region, like I'm doing today, I'm going to have to keep remembering which button to push because my muscle memory is saying which button to push. And I have to cognitively remember to switch. And it's going to cause a lot of errors, most likely misclicks and stuff. And we will probably see that today. Um, but that's why we want to follow regional consistency, regional mental models as well, because that gets into the next pillar of usability, which is workload. We want to minimize the workload. And that's one of the things we want to minimize is that workload of how we translate those regional games. Um, even if we don't have the funding to change the regional controls on a retrofitted, retrofitting a game can be very difficult to do after the fact. Uh, especially as the technology changes and you have you might end up having to redo the whole thing just to do that and that's not always feasible at all so how do we still make that usable without retrofitting it if after the fact and that's a, and and that's yet another reason to have ux on the team because that may have been something that you could have a, a, a granted that the one that we're playing today was probably never intended to be in america so understandable that they didn't have someone on the team thinking about that back then. That's understandable because I'm not even sure how old this game is, but it was probably not intended for America because it's in completely in Japanese. Um, they do have English subtitles, though, that were probably added. Or maybe. I need to look at when it was made. But... Um, Workload then is your player's cognitive load and their physical load. So the cognitive load is, for example, me having to take the time to remember, stop myself from my muscle memory pushing the button that I'm used to pushing and making myself push the other button 
because it's, I have to remember this is not an American game. It's a Japanese game, so I have to push a different button. So that's mental workload. That's cognitive workload is to have to stop and do that because that's slowing down my game. And that's very detrimental if I'm in a high action game. This game's fine. It's not, it's not hugely high action, but there are like, it's going to be a little bit more active in some places than others because of boss fights, I think. But for the most part, it's not a high, high action game. So it's not as huge of a deal in this one, but there, are, if you're playing in like an MMO or something, you're in a boss fight, it's not. That's going to be very frustrating, for sure. Especially if it ends in you dying constantly because you have to keep remembering which button is the right button to push. So that is cognitive load. That is what is taking your attention and your memory. You should be able to focus on the game, not have to focus on the controllers or the interface. And then the physical workload is how many button clicks or whatever is needed to do a thing. Is it cumbersome? Why, like there are some things, sometimes a game requires three different buttons to do one action. Why, why, why not just do one button? Um, why? <laughs> so ask why, why was it so cumbersome? Because it was fine when you're doing something non-active, but if you're in a boss fight and you have to do that same function, Adding on the stress of what's going on with the boss fight, trying to stay alive in this fight, and also having to remember this overly cumbersome button combination that's not necessary to begin with, as far as I can tell, that just makes you want to, I have actually raged quit on that, specifically, in the past. So, that's what's going to happen. And that is detrimental if you're want people to actually finish your game because um, you did do all that work it would be good for them to at least finish the game and so that your interactions should not be cumbersome or overly complicated and your players should be able to focus on the game mechanics not on the on how to do the thing unless that's a part of the game mechanic specifically and then error prevention and recovery, that is preventing them from like foreseeing any kind of errors that could happen that aren't a part of the game mechanic and then preventing them. And that, for example, would be the most common is exiting without saving. How can we prevent that from happening? Because then somebody's lost two or three hours of gameplay and that has also happened to me. I've done two, three hours of gameplay and didn't save. And because I was on a plane and I had to I had to turn off my device to leave. And I was done. I had finished the game. I was done with it. And I had to turn off my device. I didn't realize it wouldn't keep me where I was. So, because I was in the end game scene, I was watching the end cutscene. Okay. And so I thought it was done. I thought it had known, yeah, she's done. Um, and I wasn't intending on it. Completely putting me back to the very beginning of the final boss fight, which had taken me forever to do. And... I have not played it again since, and it's been years, and I love that game. But I am so frustrated about the fact that it wasn't saved, and I have to do that boss fight all over again, that I have not worked up my willingness to play it again. I really wish that it was available on the PC so I could play it for you, because it is an, I love the game. It's an awesome game. It's another platformer from Japan called Muramasa, the Demon Blade. Love the game, but really frustrated about that. I will get back to it eventually, but that boss fight was so frustrating that I finally got through it and then it didn't save. 
And yeah, so that is what we're talking about as far as error prevention and recovery. Could there have been some way of warning me, hey, this isn't saved. You probably don't want to do this. Save it real quick. But give me a way to do that, including in the cutscene. Why do I have to wait for the entire cutscene to end before I can save it? Because I have to shut this thing down now. Life is happening to me right now. I can't continue. I have to shut off my device. So let me do so without losing all of that work that I just did. These are things because life happens. We need to be able to let them save and quit when they need to without losing all that progress. So that is what we're talking about with error prevention and recovery. Because, I mean, I haven't... I tried it once again, but the boss fight was so frustrating I kept dying again. And it's been so long since I played it that I forgot the trick that I used to beat the boss. And so now I have to relearn it. And... I'm not motivated to do that right now, so I haven't played it again, even though it's an awesome game. And that's what we're talking about here. That could have been so avoided by just letting me save when I needed to save. That was it. So that's what we're talking about here. Error prevention and recovery and how it detrimental this poor UX can be to an awesome game. Um. And then flexibility, the more customizable the game is, uh, for example, in terms of control mapping, font size, colors, sound, uh, audio levels, difficulty levels, language, uh, the more accessible it will be for all players who want to actually play the game, including people with disabilities. Like I said before, I have sensitive hearing for some reason and everything sounds very loud to me. It's very annoying to me. And the music that's playing right now is incredibly loud to me, but I'm bearing with it because people are telling me that the sound on the on my stream is too soft. So I'm trying different things to make it sound so you can actually hear it, but it's very loud to me, very loud. I feel like I'm having to yell to speak over the music. And maybe that's beneficial for y'all because people tell me I talk too low. So maybe it's working for you, but it's uncomfortable for me because it's going to make my throat start hurting from yelling. Sorry about the mic and um, my ears. It's very loud, um, but it may not be for you. So that's what we're talking about. Um, but when I'm playing a game, I need to be able to adjust the sound settings. And uh, that was the point I was getting at. <laughs> I need to be able to adjust the sound settings in the game to turn down the background music and turn up the voices because if the background music is such a volume then I'm having a hard time understanding the voices and I need to understand the voices more than I need to hear the music. So let me adjust that and that's going to be something with anyone with a hearing impairment as well. When you have a hearing impairment it's harder to distinguish sounds from each other. My issue is loudness everything's too loud but there are other people who have that who have a difficulty in hearing hearing impairment are going to have issues distinguishing the different sounds and so they need to be able to adjust those sounds you need to have flexibility in there for them for that and again people with english second language and we're about to see an example of that here as well in the game that we're going to play today japanese game um Starts in Japanese, but we have to learn how to get the English on. So how do we do that if we don't speak Japanese? Fortunately, I speak enough to do it. We'll see. I don't. I don't remember exactly what it looks like. Um, off the top of my head, but it starts in Japanese, and then we have to switch to English. But that flexibility is going to enable more and more people to play your game. Basically what I'm saying. Colors, color contrast. If you can allow people to adjust the colors based on color blindness, because color blindness is one of the most common uh, visual impairments out there. Let people adjust the color so that they can see your game. Um, or make the colors with enough contrast to begin with so that there's not an issue to begin with. And that is also possible. Um, but... 
there are ways to set the gain so that it can be for specific types of color blindness. And if people know that they have color blindness, they usually know what type. So you can uh, give them the options for that. If they know they have color blindness, they may not. And then uh, the three pillars of engageability are motivation, emotion, and game flow. These are what keeps them playing your game or makes them want to play it to begin with. So what's the motivation here? Do they have a sense of competency? If I feel like that I'm not competent in a game, I drop it. I don't play it because I feel stupid and I don't want to feel stupid and I don't want to feel incompetent. So do I feel competent playing this game? Do I feel good? Do I feel like I'm a hero playing this game or not? Or do I feel like I'm just derping everything? What's the motivation to keep playing this game? Um, relatedness, meaning, what are their motives? Continue playing. What kind of rewards are they getting? Are they meaningful rewards that are textual or that meaningful in the moment? Like if they're a brand new player and they can't craft until level 10 or 15, don't give them a bunch of crafting materials they can't use. It's just going to load up their in their inventory and not let them be able to get things they do need, like potions and gear, which they need right now. So think about the meaning of the rewards that you're giving them. Make them meaningful to them now. There are exceptions to that, of course, like if you're trying to build them up to look forward to something, but you need to know that balance. And then emotion is the polish of the feel, the game feel the presence, the tone, and there's a specific tone that we're going to see today and uh, that is very uh, intentional. Um, and that game feel, that sense of presence in the game, um, discoverability, surprises, the camera control, character, these are the things that um, This, this feel, this emotion of a game is very important to motivating people to continue playing it. And the game flow is the, the flow of the game. Uh, then there's this pacing of the game and how, you, you know, usually in a good game, it starts out very simple with simple interactions and it slowly builds up and makes the game uh, more difficult. As you learn the interactions, as you learn the skills over time, they get more complicated, more complicated and build up in, in difficulty. And that is the game flow. It, you don't want it to be totally difficult right away because that's going to keep people from wanting to play. Because again, that sense of competence, do they feel competent? So they need to start basic, feel competent, Increase difficulty, feel competent. Increase difficulty, feel competent. And there's a skill, there's a science to that as well. And so that pacing, how long it takes them to increase competency and so forth. That is a very, also another very important thing for keeping people engaged in your game. So all these things work together to make a great experience, a great game. And so now we are going to talk about the game that we're playing today. And that is Kokoro Kroba Part 1. Kokoro Clover Part 1. This is the Japanese retro pixel 2D platformer. And it was, okay, so it's not very old. It was made in 2020, but it's a retro game. So if it was made in 2020, then they should have been able to... I wonder if it was released in America in 2020. So the game developer is Hikotaru. Um, they have a part one and a part two. I haven't finished the game yet because I want to study the Japanese. That's the whole reason I bought this game, um, is so that I could study the Japanese of it. Um, but they did add uh, English to it, but some of it is still in Japanese, so you have to be able to understand that. Or the question is, and this is something about internationalization, and if I haven't written anything about internationalization yet, on, I need to. 
I need to because I don't think I have. I don't remember. I don't think I have. So I need to. Um, but this game is... It's kind of a gag game. It is an action platformer in the style of a Sunday morning anime TV show. So these were the children's shows that they showed in Japan on Sunday mornings that teach you English, they teach you the Japanese language, they teach you, but they're not like too heavy, violent ac action because they're small kids. Um, so it's good for people in America who want to learn Japanese and to learn that, but it was intended as a Japanese game for that nostalgia for people. Uh, so this joined Spirit Summoner Treffy in this side-scrolling action platformer in a style of a Sunday morning anime TV show. In part one, Treffy begins her story with spirit friends and some clumsy bad guys, fight using magic and transform using elemental spirits in this exciting and comedic adventure. And uh, this is the first in the series. I think there's two. There's only two right now. And the playtime is 40 minutes to an hour. I don't know if we're going to make it because I do talk a lot about stuff. So we'll see. But there are different modes that you can play. So uh, keyboard is recommended for some reason, but I prefer controller. So we'll be using a controller. So I guess you can configure your key bindings now. Seems to be an update. All right, so let's get to it. And the reason I don't already have the game loaders is because there's something very important that I wanted to talk about and demonstrate to you while we're loading the game. This is detrimental to VR. So I want to show it um, as I'm loading it. So bear with me for a minute while I get it loaded. Get my camera out of the way so you can actually see it. It's going to be a little silence for a minute while I get the game going. So you can hear it, it's already started. And you've already missed something before you could even see it. And it's auto progressing. So I can't read it fast enough, even though it looks like based on this little symbol here that you are supposed to manually progress. That's what that pattern is. I'm not. Uh, it's auto-progressing, and I missed all of it. And it started before I even got it loaded onto OBS, before OBS even picked it up. That is not something you want to happen in VR. You want them to have... You want them to have control on when it starts, especially if it's in VR, because while they're loading... the um, While the game's loading, they're still... It, depending on the headset, of course, PC-based, it's going to be definitely for PC-based, and there's still a lot of PC-based ones out there, and there probably will be because of Steam and all that until they can get it set up differently. That's how it's going to be for a while. Um, so, having the game load before you can even get your headset on and situated and all that, getting your controller situated and all that, you're missing everything, and that even happens with Oculus games, with the Quest, uh, with standalone headsets, is they could still be like getting everything situated while the game's loading. So you want to give them the power over when the game starts, not just start playing as soon as the game starts. Sure, you can have games. Sure, you can have something going, but it doesn't need to be something that's like important to the story. You don't want it to be something that's important to the story. Uh, and that has happened. Um, cards, cards and Tankers, I believe, is one of them. Oh, it stayed in English this time. 
last time I loaded it, it started in Japanese, but it's in English this time, so never mind. But I can't remember if the start game and the language were in Japanese or English, but now it's in English. So here, let's look at language. We've got Nihongo and English. Um, so the question is, now, because it's already said in English, I'm using my keyboard right now. I'm using the arrow keys right now. The question is whether or not... Where are the settings? I had to switch to my controller because I couldn't remember which key was for select. Just read, probably. Okay, now I'm using my D-pad on my controller. And I have to remember that I have to use the circle, not the X, because it's backwards on the Japanese game. Here are my options. Gameplay controls. I want to use... Did it automatically detect that I'm using a controller? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it did. But you see this diagram here where it's got the D-pad and then it's got the colored buttons. You know what? Nope, nope, they don't match. I was gonna say they match, but they don't match. The colors don't match, so it's not a consistency in color, but even so, if you're colorblind, that's not gonna matter. Um, so this is an old gamepad controller that they've designed this for. As you can see, this this is an old game, an old little mini game controller um, that they've designed it for. Or that they just intended it to be retro to do that but then when you do that when you do this yeah we want it to look like a little ds or whatever i never had a ds i'm assuming that's what it's like um you still want the buttons to be comprehensible so normally in most of your game controllers you are going to have the d-pad on the left and the other controls on the right that's the normal setup which is what they have here so your D-pad is normally how you move things, um, especially in the older games. Um, all of the newer controllers have joysticks, but those are not usable in this game at all because it's a retro game. They've intended it to be like a retro game. Um, but let's see what it's like. I don't think that these buttons, which are the ones that you use the most in the game, are going to show during gameplay. I think they just show these letters, but these letters are completely different um, than the controller. Because these, these letters are actually, I think these are just the keyboard, the QWERTY, okay, yeah, they're the, I think they're just the QWERTY controls. Yeah, they're just the QWERTY keyboard controls, so it's giving me the keyboard controls, but it's also giving me controllers. Again, they said that keyboard is recommended, but I am terrible on a keyboard. So we're not doing a keyboard. Because that adds on to that cognitive workload, because then I have to remember how to use the keyboard. Which I'm not as good at. And I mentioned, I think it was last week when we were playing Trine, that I have an actual physical issue with the keyboard because of my small hands and my joints. My joints, I, I tend to white finger the keyboard for whatever reason. I don't know why. Probably because I'm not used to it. But by white knuckling that, it's actually physically hurting my hands and I can't play as long because my hands are hurting on the keyboard. So and that's because I have joint... Um, joint issues like my um like they're double jointed and so they'll lock up um when i'm pressing too hard and it starts hurting so that's something to think about is you want your physical workload to not be so cumbersome that they can't play and that's especially important in vr is the physical fatigue the ergonomics, the physical net feet design of the game needs to be such that you're not going to cause those kinds of 
stress pains and and it's unnecessary to do so how can you prevent it now the keyboard control that i don't know how you would prevent that unless you just with flexibility that's the flexibility thing let us use controllers let us change out our controllers if we need to and that's in vr as well uh, there are different controllers that you can use you can use index knuckles with a PC based headset, let it, let them do so. Let them be able to adjust that in your game because there could be a reason other than just um, it's a cool controller. It could be some kind of actual need for it to be that way. So, story. So, let's see what kind of options did they have? We did look at the options, didn't we? It was controller, you can change the border color. Oh, you can replay the open cinematic, so if you missed it, you can replay it. Okay. And we want it in English. And I don't know how to go. I'm, okay, right. Keyboard. I, I, or Jap Japan versus. US. I was hitting the zero instead of the X because they're backwards and my muscles want to do it the way I'm used to doing it in America. Okay, let's start with the prologue. So there was something that I was saying earlier about good design of an international game. If you have a second English as a second language, or any language as a second language, you want is the design such that they can still understand to get to where they need to to change the language is that something important to think about it needs it doesn't help them if you have the language options here it doesn't help them if you have the language options and the original language like you see here they've got nihongo which is their language, that they understand that, but then they've changed English to be in English. And again, this music is so incredibly loud to me right now. It's hurting my ears and I'm yelling as a result of it, which maybe that's good for you because maybe you can hear me, but it's uncomfortable to me. But um, let me know if that makes it sound better. Because again, it's... My ears aren't the right gauge, apparently, for the volume. But anyway, English is in English, because that's the language that they speak. So if you were going to add Spanish, you wouldn't list it in the native language of the game. You would list it in Spanish, Espanol, or Francais. You wouldn't say... Like, I know a lot of, um, it's getting better, but a lot of experiences will just list it out in English, like English, Spanish, French. But if they're speaking French, they may not understand that. Maybe they do because they've dealt with it enough, but it's not helpful, especially if you're dealing with completely different alphabets. Uh, so put the, put the language list option in their language not our language that's what i'm saying so this is a good practice what they've done here nihongo is how they understand it that means japanese and english is in english and that's what you would want to do Playing the story, starting with the prologue. Intruder alert. Bring me up to speed. Jokyoa? Valks made his way on board the ship after attacking us with that giant robot.
He stole the Kokoro Clover and is making his escape. The cargo hold, as well as Deck B, have sustained heavy damage. So one of the issues here is legibility of the English. If you're fluent in the language, it should be easy enough. But if you're not fluent in the language, it's going to be a little harder to make out what it's saying because the pixels are very strongly pixeled. And I've tried it at different sizes to see if it made it any better, but it's not. But I think they are making it true to retro, so. But if you're doing subtitles, they have a good behavior here. And we talk about it pretty much every week because it happens every week is there at the beginning. They auto progressed everything. And so you didn't have time to finish reading it. But here they're letting you manually progress it which is good practice. Let people manually progress it and choose not to. As you can see up here in the corner, there's this option to skip. So I can skip this if I want. Um, give them those options. Give them that flexibility to do that. I can't believe he'd attack us during our import voyage from the king for the kingdom. You sadistic poor excuse of a little brother. The lengths you'll go to just to get in my way. Nanda, what now? That doesn't need translation. Awaiting orders of Valclair. Shoot him down. Sir? You heard me, they took the Kokoro Clover. Fire at the insolent robot and don't stop. But sir, we... He's evaded my grasp for the near 10 years that I've been pursuing this. Do you have any idea how many times he's gotten in my way? Or the countless times I've let him get away? Well, I won't let him make a fool of me any longer. Now's my chance to take him down once and for all. Don't let him escape. Obliterate that robot. Understood. <laughs> There's no way my dumb brother can reach us when we're this far out. You know, Nekoko, that was a flawless victory if I say so myself. If I do say so myself. I don't know, personally speaking, I think the way we barged in there lacked style and grace. Are you kidding me? They're shooting at us. No, uh, I dropped the Kokoro Clover. What are you littering now? I told you, you should have come aboard instead of showing off out there. Uh-oh, we've got a problem. The controls are malfunctioning. Brace for impact. Or what? No, do something. Hershey Valglair, if I'm going down, you're coming with me. Direct hit, sir. Now we got him. Now the robot's flying toward us at high speed. Direct hit on the port wing. We can't sustain flight like this. We what? No, do something. I guess that's the Cocoa Clover. It fell somewhere in that forest. That someone happens to live in. Time to rise and shine, sleepy head. You've been asleep all morning. I hit the wrong button again, I think. No, I didn't. Oh, no, you don't. Okay. So you have to manually pick the chapter. It's not going to continue for you. I guess that's a good way of being able to play in short stints. That you can pick where you are.
Come on, Gramps. Chi-chan. Watashi. I want to go out and see the world. Abini detai. That means I want to go out and see the world. Damn it. Absolutely not. What? No fair. You didn't even listen to me. Mo, kyo wa hayai yo. Already heard it before, Chuffy. Yesterday, the day before, last week, you're a broken record. You hear? Enough of that, hogwash. Your imagination's running too wild with all them books you read. This here forest is all you need. It's peaceful. And there ain't no one around to be afraid of you being a spirit summoner. So this is something that you want to think about for, like, subtitles and stuff, is placement of text. You know, in the main text, which is what they've designed, which is good, is that it there's this clear box around it, and there's good uh, distinction between the colors and the background, and you've got the character that's talking here, and you've got this little indicator here saying that it's time to push the button for to proceed once you're ready. These are all design patterns that are... This is a mental model that is a good mental model for a dialogue box. So you want to keep that in mind when you're doing any kind of dialogue. How does that behave? But then how does that how does that translate to XR when you've got this dialogue? And we've played with that before on my own, myself, uh, with previous teams that I've worked on. Um, there are different options, different solutions. Uh, the one that I did did test very well uh, with usability testing. Um, you want to think about ergonomic placement in VR. And let me write that down so we can remember to talk about that. Um, I'm trying to remember where I put that in, a, in an article or a video. Um, you've got French and dialogue or even normal dialogue. Um, you do still want these dialogue boxes in XR. Because again, there's a reason that they're here because life happens outside of the game and you need to be able to know what's going on. And also this is a money saver on voiceover work, which may or may not, it depends, may or may not be different in VR, but this this could also work in VR, but it is good to have voiceover, but there are tricks for that too, to save money. But the thing that I was talking about was this subtitle here. The placement of this subtitle is the... So you want your body copy. The body copy here is good because it's easily scannable. You've got it at a certain width. Um, and there's a max width to it, but this down here is taking up the entire width of the bottom screen, which makes it harder to scan. Um, so that slows down your reading time. And so, but this is a faster read, if, of course, if you can read Japanese, uh, but um, body copy should be pixels, pixel wise on web. I'm, I, I don't know how that translates because it's not pixels. In games, it's, well, it depends, but um, it's more meters, centimeters, things like that. In games, uh, how does that translate um, into Unity and so forth is there's a max width to your dialogue. On the web, it's 800 pixels, I believe, 600 to 800 pixels for easy scanning and legibility for body copy. You don't want it wider than that because then it makes it takes longer to read to move down to the next line and that's where we get into that whole cumbersome workload issue. It's too cumbersome to read. You can't scan it quickly. So you keep your body copy more narrow for faster reading. Sorry, I think I hit my mic. You don't realize how good you got it here, sweetheart. All baby birds have to leave the nest sometime. 
Baby birds don't decide when to leave for themselves. You ain't even 10 years old yet. No way I'm letting a little girl go on a journey all by herself. But Dee and Sal both say that they'll come with me. You're gonna stick out like a sore thumb with a couple of spirits by your side. Listen, Treffy, regular folk, they just don't understand spirits. Even the townsfolk nearby are afraid of them. I'm worried that everyone outside won't accept you for being what you are, a spirit summoner. I just don't want to see you hurt, sweetheart. How time sure does fly. It's already been nine years since I found you. Now look at you. Huh? Where'd you go? Better luck next time, I guess. Not fair, D. You do understand why Grants feels that way, though, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, your compass. Isn't that a keepsake? Yeah, Grant said it was holding... I was holding it when he found me. Oh, look at the shape of that thing. Very interesting, the shape of that thing. It has a certain shape to it that's very, very similar to something that just fell from the sky. But it's busted. The needle doesn't move. Because it's missing something. I guess it's kind of like a metaphor. The needle won't move and neither will I. But I kind of... But I'm going to fix it and go on a great big adventure. I want to see all kinds of new places and meet all kinds of new spirits, too. And I want to know why. Why do I have this power to harness spirits but nobody else does? Maybe I'll even find my pet. Oh, sorry, I got carried away there. Okay, well, anyway, Salamander said he wants to see you. Sal does, huh? Okay, let's go see him. Now we get to learn how to use the controls. I'm, it's just taking me a minute to remember which button to push. I have to push the circle, not the X. Cognitive workload. Okay, and we're not using joysticks as I'm used to using. We're now going to use the D-pad to move because the joysticks don't work. Okay. <clears throat> and the X is jumping. And now here it says A to shoot on the keyboard. I think that's the keyboard. Yeah, that's the keyboard, A. But how does that translate onto the controller? I had to trial and error this and um, turns out it's the square, which is the inside button on the controller. Undine restores life. Oh, okay. That's what assist means. Okay. And I don't know what W means. Oh, open the menu. Okay. On the keyboard, W. And on the controller, I just hit something. It's this triangle button on the controller. So that gets into the whole give them flexibility to use different controllers because there's many reasons that they may need a different controller. Like I was saying earlier. Oh, when we've got a little monkey. So dance is Q. So you have to hold down the Q to dance. But on the controller... Nope, that's not it. I'm hitting the right bumper right now, and that's changing my hair color. Um, and the left bumper. Okay, hold down the left bumper button to dance with the monkey. Okay. Okay, and this, those little coins, as you know, for if you've played old games, those are a very common mental model from platformers. And, okay, you have to hit the, hit that too. I don't know what I just got though. Is that the slime? Those little coins are like a common reward. Okay, and I guess the bread, bread gives back health. So it's just using symbols to let you know these things give back health.
and I'm all clear. Yay. Okay. Just having to remember again which button I push to continue. A witch here in the forest? That's right, a witch lives in the woods near here. You two best keep your distance. Ugh, Dad, not that story again. It's how the legend goes. They say she possesses her victims. Well, I heard it's just a little girl and her grandpa that live there. And the two of them never come around here anymore because people like you keep spreading these nasty rumors. You know, Nekoko, I don't really care what these two are talking about. But I'll let you... But I'll bet you it's worth our while to check that place out. Yeah. I'm positive that you know what's nearby. That forest is dense with mana. It's gotta be close. You two aren't thinking about going there, are you? It isn't safe, really. There are monsters, and who knows what else. Heh <laughs> that won't be a problem for us. Nekoko, now that we've got our bellies full, what do you say we blow this joint? You know, buddy, we really appreciate you ordering so much, but uh, are you two gonna be able to cover all that? But of course, check these. Oh, on second thought, make that a rain check. Oh, yeah? Yeah, Neko, now. Time to pounce. Cat Terminator. They didn't pay. That's what bad guys do. They don't pay. Just remember again which button to push. That's what is taking me longer to do that. Because I keep trying to push the wrong button. Good morning, Sal! Oops. I accidentally hit that twice. Sorry. I don't know what they said. No dice. Hey, there's always tomorrow. I guess I, he's probably asking if they're going on a trip. Okay. Anyway, what's up? I heard you wanted to see me. Oh yeah, so I was hanging out near the outskirts of the forest today and I saw a spirit I've never seen before. They took off before I could say anything. You don't know them, do you? What do they look like? Let's see, I guess kind of like a cat. It doesn't sound familiar to me, they just, they must be new. It's been about four or five years now since you first appeared in the woods, right, Sal? Yeah, I know what it feels like being new around here, so I wanted to be the first to introduce myself. You don't have the most gentle appearance. Maybe they were scared. Scared of what? I look awesome, D. How about we go look for them together? They're probably afraid being all alone in a brand new place. Yeah, good idea. So we're going to be asking the question, how would we translate this 2D platformer pixel game into a VR? Should we? Can we? I think we definitely can. We'll talk about that in a minute. Oh, and it's telling you the reward before you start the... that's nice. And the game music changed. That's fun. And... There's your coin. The common reward. And the coins, there's a store, so you can buy stuff in-game. Do I want to go down there? I can't go down. How would I get down there? Ah! Ah! Assist! So yeah, but then um, I had to remember which button pushed there because I was pushing the wrong one. Which can be frustrating when it's a little bit more high action.
Okay, now we can dance again. Yay. Okay, do I want to go down? Yes. This reminds me of Yeah, I can't get there. And I get to dance. I think I got a new dance now. Is it 127 play a little bit longer and then we'll talk oh there's a boss battle so maybe i'll try the boss battle so other humans can't fire off mana like you can can they what do they do if they get attacked by monsters that's a good point you don't see humans with swords and stuff very often yeah but that's only around these parts Steve. graham said that the kingdom has lots of soldiers and they all have swords sure what was that it came from over there. Let's check it out. Burn, baby, burn. Campfire Inferno. That's the cat spirit. Hey, Sal, is that the cat spirit you're talking about? That's no spirit. Hey, you, you better knock it off. Show some respect to Mother Nature. Who's this little brat? Oh, good job. Hup, hup. There were people inside there. You too, identify yourselves. Listen carefully. I'm the greatest treasure hunter the world has ever seen. The great Valks Vulcan in the flesh. Don't forget about me, boss. Ah, yes, my partner in crime, Nekoko Cat. So, her name is Cat Cat. Because Neko means cat in Japanese. Her name's Cat Cat. Yeah, that's right. Ooh. Never heard of you. How embarrassing. Oh, come on. I guess I shouldn't expect these country buttons to be up to date. Please, please, I know you're dying to know why we're here, what we're doing. It's written all over your faces. You do want to know, don't you? We uh, foolishly lost something very valuable to us, dropped it somewhere here in the forest. But there are all these blasted trees everywhere. So we're not having much luck finding it. We tried burning the tall grass down, but we're still at square one. So that's when I got the brilliant idea to burn everything down. Raise the forest to the ground and it's sure to be found. This guy sucks. <laughs> no, you don't. I'm not letting you do anything of that sort. Sorry, girly. We don't have time to play with kids. We've got bigger fish to fry. But if the noisy girl with braids wants to stick around, I'm happy to teach her a lesson. Braids? I uh, see a ponytail. Power on. If it's the fight you want, you got it. They're humans, though. Are you sure you want to unleash your mana on them? We're just gonna end up making them fear us like the villagers do. If it protects our forest from harm, then it's worth it. Let's do this. You're right. If they want to play with fire, they're gonna get burned. We will try a boss battle. And then... Uh-oh. Spoiler. Um... Clear the bonus, you get Volcander Assist. So, again, they're telling you... Uh-oh. How do I even win this? How do you even, like, fight this thing? I don't think you can even fight this thing. Really. About to die. I don't think you can even win this thing. I don't even know what you do. Not so sure how that works. Because all she's got is this... Uh. 
How do you even do anything to help her? So what if I... Uh, let's see. I'm trying to go back. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how to do this. So there's going to be a trick to it that I don't really have the patience to do. Yeah. This is where I generally stop playing because it's not telling me anything. So I guess I just have to use my spark, which I don't. So if I run into him, I die, basically. I'm trying to get behind him. So how do I change? I need to change to ah, my assist. Takes too long to change the assist. So I have to stop and do the menu. Is there a faster way to switch between these two assists? Uh wait, there's a transform? Or is that what's the difference in the transforms? Ruffy's normal self. Spirited with Salamander and Spirited with Udine. So I need her in Spirited with Salamander. Fire attribute, I guess. It's not really explaining. So we'll try that and then we'll get Undine to Siren? Maybe? I don't know. We'll try that. See if that works. Okay. No, nope, still died. I don't know. I don't know the trick. And it's getting frustrating knowing the trick. Oh, and I have to change it already. And I don't know how to dodge or anything. There's like no way to dodge that I can tell. So I, I don't know what to do here. This is not explaining anything. Not explaining it. So yeah, I, I don't understand. So this is something that they could do, is teach you anything here about the boss fight, because those little monsters were hugely different, and I have no options for how I dodge. I have no options for dodging. I'm not doing any damage whatsoever. It didn't teach me about the different things, and so now I just want to... I don't even know how to quit. How do you quit? F. That's appropriate. Okay. I don't need, I have no idea what to do here. So this is where competency and onboarding come in because yeah they taught me how to do the normal platformer stuff but then once it got to the boss and maybe because i haven't bought any bosses on these platformer games in forever and i've completely forgotten anything about it um i don't have that mental model if there is one or if you're just supposed to figure it out but i'm not motivated to do that right now so that goes back to motivation 
Why, why do I care when I can just skip? I can just skip to the next part. Skip the boss fight altogether. I guess that's a good option to keep me playing. Without having to deal with the boss fight. Because it's annoying. And they had, didn't teach me how to do it. So why do I want to do it? Because I just keep dying. Um, so something to think about. I mean, I guess this is an option, though, if you want to let them, if they can't figure out the boss fight, but instead of them rage quitting and getting stuck and never playing the game again, one option is to let them skip ahead and continue playing the game. <laughs> it's a good option, because then they can at least get the story. So that's, I guess that's a good option. Yeah. So it is now 1.30 my time, so I guess we will stop and start talking about what we can learn from this. Um, yeah. Writing down about after thing. So, I guess the learning curve pacing of this wasn't quite what it needed to be to teach me how to fight the boss. Um, and then the normal player reaction is, or I'm just stupid and can't figure it out. But that is actually a UX question because that's not necessarily, if we were from a UX designer, say we wouldn't say, no, that's not the user that's stupid. There's something wrong with the design, keeping them from understanding what they need to do. Can we make it better? Is the intent of the challenge to make them figure out by trial and error? Some people like that. Maybe that's the option. But you need to question yourself on why. Um, is that the goal? Is that they have to keep playing until they figure it out? Or is there something that you can teach them to help them figure it out? Um, and there are a lot of people out there that who do really like the trial and error, error to figure it out. They'll play it and play it and play it until they do figure it out. And that is a target audience. That is definitely a target audience. Um, but their solution um, is good in that if you are one of those people, this is flexibility, I guess. If you are one of those people that doesn't want to sit there and figure out how to fight the boss, then you can just skip to the next storyline and continue with the game without having to deal with the boss fight. So I guess that's a good solution because that's one of the reasons that I've rage quit a game and never continued it is because I'd get stuck on a fight and I couldn't get past it and then I don't want to deal with it anymore so I just stop playing the game altogether. But now with this I can just skip it and keep playing which is good. So they've thought about that. They've thought about that child target audience that um even though I'm not a child, there are still adults out there like that who don't want to keep playing the same thing over and over again because it's just too frustrating to figure out. And I don't, I'm not that kind of gamer. I don't like having to sit there and play it for 10 hours to figure out how to beat the boss. I'd rather just do something else. I have better things to do with my time. So I'll just skip to the next scene if I can. I like that. I'll do that. Um, so now let's go do our Rose Thorn Bud thing. So give me a second while I switch sound. Okay. So let's start with our Rose Thorn Bud exercise. So the Rose Thorn Bud exercise is, it's that method that, it's a good quick method to use for critical thinking about something and to get a good list of things that are good, things that are not so good, and what, what can we do about it. Um, it is good for all kinds of things, retrospectives on an experience, on how your team works together, all kinds of things. You can use them, it's used often in Agile for retrospectives and for post-mortems. Post-mortem is at the end of a project. Um, 
at the end of a project cycle where you go back and you say, how did this thing go? That's called a postmortem. These can also be used in a postmortem. They can be used uh, to get feedback from users on stuff. And it's what we're, whatever, it can be an experience. It can be a game. It can be an application. It can be some kind of process, it's feedback on all kinds of things. So the benefit of the roses is that you are listing out what's working because you don't want to forget what's working. Because if you forget what's working in the middle of fixing the things that aren't working, you might inadvertently get rid of something good that is working and you don't want to forget what's good because you don't want to replace it trying to fix what's bad because it could get in the project life cycle you're in the weeds and things can get missed things can get overlooked things can get forgotten and it's also good to just from a motivation standpoint of a team working on stuff is to Hey, we did this good thing. This works. This is good. We need to continue doing this thing. Um, continue doing it because it turns out maybe that's a good best practice. Continue doing it because it's a good solution for this specific game. Um, all kinds of reasons. So you want to think about the good things and you want to note down the good things and then and we'll see that because at the end of this whole series that I'm doing on platformers genre is we will go back and we will look at all of them once that I've played and we'll do a kind of a report on that. And I'll do that with you together so that you can see how can we make a report out of this study that we've done on platformers so that you can learn that too. And that will again give you more experience if you, especially if you participate, that will give you more experience on doing this whole, this this would be called a, if I were doing this for work, for a project, this would be called competitive landscaping where I go and I play existing games and I see what's good, what's working about them, what's not working about them. What do I like? What do I don't like as a UX professional that has this design fluency on what works and what doesn't work. And you get that design fluency over time and with experience. Um, so again, doing these things with me and me talking about them out loud will help you gain a little more fluency as you pay attention and as you watch and as you learn as we go, because I'm thinking out loud as we're doing it. So that will help you gain in fluency as well. Uh, it will, it, it'll take time, of course, fluency in anything, languages, anything takes time. Uh, and doing it for yourself and practicing it for yourself also helps with that fluency. Uh, so it's not just watching, it's also participating and gaining experience doing it is what helps build fluency. So let's get to it. And so thorns are what didn't go well, what was low point. Um, so you want to list out those things because those are the things that you want to, you either want to address or you want to research more. So there's going to be some kind of next step. You may have already have a solution for it because it could be that it missed a best practice and you just need to follow that best practice, or it could be something that you need to look further into because it could be a potential bug. It could be something um, that is a little more complex of an issue. And it may have been, oh, I've never seen this happen before. I've never seen anyone have this issue before. This is something we should study in a usability test or something. So that would be our bud, our next step for that. So the buds are what opportunities do you see? What or how can we, if there are, if they are specific things that you can do like best practices that can fix the thorn, then yeah, that's it. That would be a bud but it could be following up and investigating something and adding more questions about what is, there's a question around this thorn or a question around some kind of opportunity that I saw during this whole process that could be followed up on. And the buds are giving you a direct list of next steps. So you've got a well-defined list of what's good, what's not so good, what do we do about it? Um, and keeping them separate is also important at this stage. And you'll see it, you'll see why when we do the report uh, after the end of this, because we're going to do that together. Um, so, okay, what went well? So, as far as, um, 
Kentucky. So this was a relatively new game. It's not a retro game, but they made it look like a retro game. So one of the good things that they did was that they made it successfully look like a retro game because before I looked at the date that it was released, and maybe that was just the date it was released on Steam in America, that's possible, that maybe it was... Um, wait, who was the developer on this one? Was it Hikoteru? I think I found their website at one point. Hikoteru. See if we can find them. Hikote. Oh, Hikoter. Hikoteru. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Chrome has a translator. Yeah, it, nope, it's 2020. So originally released in 2020, I guess. So yeah, it's a new game. So they successfully made it look retro. Because before I looked at that date, I thought it was a retro game that they just recently released over here. But it was made to be a retro game. So that's... They did a good job of... So it's a recent game successfully made it feel, made it look and feel retro. And it has that, has that Sunday morning cartoon feel. Even the cartoons over here in America, it has that kind of feel. The bad guys are simple clumsy, entertaining, because you don't want, it's when you're a kid, that stuff's scary. So you want it to be more comical at that point. So they did a good job of making it um, feel more like a kid's cartoon, even though it's possibly adults playing it. Um, another good thing was that they followed those um, about the design pattern for dialogue boxes. Because um, they had that... Um, at, they had that good contrast of color and... Um, so I'm grouping them by thought here and you'll see that I'm doing short and incomplete sentences. That's one of the reasons I like using the post-its is because it keeps the notes very short and concise and again you'll see the benefit of this when we work on the report later but this is very good at this stage to keep the notes short and concise and, and record yourself. So I have the recording, because this was recording while we played, and I've got these notes. So I can go back and refer to the recording, or I can open up the game and play it again if I must. But keeping the notes to remember stuff, but keeping the notes short and concise at this point is going to help with faster reporting later. And that reporting can take on multiple different meth different formats later it's more efficient to keep it short now so that you can create these different forms later and they can be all different kinds of reports all different kinds of summaries keeping it short now helps you easily scan the info to see your patterns and we'll see that when i do the report at the end of this that'll be a special stream um, that we do where we do that report and And look at the look at the trends, look at the patterns, and this is the this is very beneficial to use this short, concise way of writing, so that it's more efficient later. 
It's all about streamlining it for faster synthesis. So they had a good contrast of color. They had a clear uh, differentiation from the background. From the, from the game environment. So you could clearly see it. Uh, and it had the... It had those design patterns like the... Um, the character that was speaking. And then highlighted. And the like with emotion on their face, that is a common thing in dialogue boxes that we're, we're seeing across games, not just platformers, but that's the thing, a pattern that we're seeing across games. So that would be a, a pattern that we want to pay attention to. Um, and there was, there was another one. There was that, uh, little, um, that little indicator that, uh, it's time to progress, manual progress, the dial-up, a little triangle that we saw that was blinking, and the fact that they had manual progress of dialogue. dialogue. Um, that was also good. And what else was good? Let's see. The initial onboarding taught you the basics. It's a separate thing. What simple type teaches basics? Um, of the interactions and and again thinking about the limitations of the technology that they're designing this to replicate is the old 2D platformers there was only so much you could do with them and you had to design within those limitations and you would see in that pattern that they had, um, oh, that's a good, that's, that's actually a good thing. Um, design, like creative design within the limit, within the tech limitations of the thing they were emulating. Um, it's like 2D pixel game. 2D retro pixel game. It has a different best practice than, say, a 3D game or a VR game. There's going to be different best practices because of the limitations of that technology. And so within that, that's a separate thing, really. It loaded off of that. So It is a best practice when you're teaching someone onboarding, and I just released a video on that that you can check out on YouTube. Um, it is in the, sh the about section, or here it is in chat. Is you can check it out on my YouTube channel, Ninja Robot Studio LLC, uh, if you uh, have to search it. Um, but the link's in the chat, and if you're watching this later on demand, then you'll already have it. Uh, have my YouTube channel. But I have the, and I will try to include it in the show notes. I'm making a note. We are onboarding. Add to the show notes. But, um, so they, this was them using creativity within their limits. So we talked earlier about UX, um, 
this misconception that it will restrict creativity. If you can use creativity and use within the tech limitations, you can use creativity within UX limitations as well. Um, it makes for a more interesting experience. And so one of the best practices for onboarding is to show them, not just tell them, show them and let them practice. So if you remember in the game, we had it, uh, let's see if there's a picture in here. There are community area. Here, community area, community hub for Kokoro Global. Here, like right here, you'll see they have this. Screenshot or video of it, maybe. Um, where it's showing and telling. So even within a 2D pixel platformer, you can still show and tell. They've got the controller, they've got the instructions, and they've got a picture of you doing it. Uh, and so this was designed within the limitations. But one of the things is that people have just taken this best practice from the 2D platformers and they've just plopped it into every other game. But thinking about the not only the limitations, but also the benefits of the different platforms, there could be better and different ways of doing this in those different platforms. So this I would not suggest this being how you teach someone to do something in XR, for example, because you have so many more options available to you in XR for how to teach someone how to do something. I would say take advantage of the platform. Don't just continue doing something the way it's always been done without thinking about why it was always done that way. This goes back to understanding why and understanding the tech limitations and the concepts behind the why. So you want to understand why so that when you get to a new platform, get to new technology, you can take that why and translate it into something even cooler in this newer technology. But I see a lot of people just doing this same solution. And one of the reasons they do the same solution, maybe because that's the way it's always been done. Sometimes they do it because they don't think that they have the time or the budget to do anything better. And sometimes I, I don't know all the reasons why. And maybe it's, it's a development issue and they or they just don't think about it because it's always been done that way. But you have all this opportunity to think of new ways to do things because there's, but if you understand the why behind it, the why behind why was it designed this way in the first place, you'll be able to translate that better into something better in XR. So it was within the technical limitations of the time so don't just tell um, is best practice. So in that time frame, all you could do was have the picture, but they could have done a little bit more than that, actually. Um, maybe. Again, I'm not really sure the limitations of these screens of these um, of these screens back then because I haven't developed one of these. Maybe I should just to see. Do a tutorial and see for myself. That's a benefit. I just need to do it. Time, all that is not on my side, <laughs> um, but something I could do at some point out of curiosity to see. Could there have been something that would have could have been better? Don't know, because I'm not a developer. And that's why it would be beneficial for you to understand as much about the development as you can, or at least what's what the capabilities are of the different technologies and different platforms. I don't know anything about the retro 2D because I hadn't designed for it, but maybe at some point it would be good to know that because maybe some point, but I'm not going to spend all my time learning retro when I need to be learning XR. But anyway, off topic. Show don't tell. So they're giving you pictures. They're a series of pictures to show you because they couldn't, I'm assuming they couldn't animate this part. Maybe they could, but it looks like they couldn't. So then since they couldn't, they gave you a series of pictures to show you what's happening. 
and along with the buttons and those are cross-platform that's i need to talk about cross-platform always always talking about cross-platform cross-platform design take advantage of the platform you're designing on don't just lift and shift and make sure that your onboarding matches the platform or the controller that they're actually using so there are ways to support that that's a best practice. That is a best practice. Okay, so is there anything else? Um, oh, I did like the fact that I could um, ability to skip around chapters. Because this let me Get the boss fight. And continue. Story. And I'll make a connection on that in a minute. So. One of the. Thorns. So again, the thorns. What didn't go swell. What was the low point? And if you're in chat and you want to participate in this, are there any, or in YouTube later, what are some other roses? What are some other things that you saw that were good that I missed here? Because again, I'm going off memory. Um, if you were doing this professionally for an analysis, you would just take notes while you're doing. And because that's, that'll help you with this later. You would just take more notes than what I did. And I didn't because I was talking um, to you, but if I were doing this professionally for a project, I would be taking notes while I play. And probably taking clips or something or making note of the time so that I could go back and get a clip later for it. But, um, and if you're watching, what are some thorns? What were some things that didn't go so well? One of the things that started out right away was the problem with the Video showing immediately. Video, the cutscene, the intro cutscene. Started playing immediately. On launch. In Japanese. Um. And like the first time I ever opened up the game, it was in Japanese. I hadn't added the English option yet. So it was in Japanese. Not native language. Um, not a native speaker, not a native reader. Um, so I ended up missed. I ended up missing. So yeah, it's, I need this to be in present tense because of the current state thing. I need. I keep forgetting to do this. I do this um, because it is a. This is the current state of the game. not a past tense thing. But that's current state. Okay. I do that because it's the present tense and I want to remind myself this is the current state of it and this is good for reports and stuff when you're doing later when you're communicating with your team issues it's good to say these things in like current state just so that it's, just, it's a subconscious thing um
end up missing the entire intro. So, um, the, another good thing was the internationalization. Um, I'll just make that simpler. Languages are listed in that language. For example, English is in English. Japanese is in Japanese. And do I have the option to do that on here? Easier on the Mac. Let's see if I can do that here. Not working here. Let me see. I don't have that option set up. I'm going to have to figure out that keyboard option. Wait. Wait, here it is. There we go. Now I have to get it back to English. Okay, English is in English, Japanese is in Japanese. Um, that is a good internationalization best practice. Oh, but it wasn't in this um, kanji, it was in... Uh, their other um, hiragana, which is the alphabet that children learn first, that you learn first, even if you're like learning it as a second language. Hiragana is what you learn first, and then as you progress, you learn the kanji. That's, that's the kanji. Um, it just automatically translated it to the kanji because it's in, uh, that's how the keyboard works, Japanese keyboard. I can turn that off somehow, but I don't want to deal with it right now. Um, so, so I end up missing the entire intro. And another thing was that was a thorn. Um, the. Uh, the uh, subtitles, the English subtitles. Um, were too wide, the body copy. So that takes, takes longer to scan. Which is definitely an issue when you're not letting um well auto pro manually progress so that was another thorn auto progress the opening and this is very very common in games it auto progresses um very common but thorn for in game is you don't want this in vr uh, and again, um, that is because they could be still situating their headset. They could be adjusting their sound. They could be still adjusting their volume controllers. They could be distracted by any number of things. So you want to give them the power to start it themselves. And that is not by launching the game. That is by pushing a button once the game is launched. Say, okay, now I'm ready. Because they could still be getting... There could be some kind of weird technical issues where the... Where the game is facing... Uh, getting them situated in physical versus virtual space, basically, is what we're talking about here. You want to give them the time to do that. And you don't know... You can't just assume that as soon as they open the game that they're ready. Give them the ability to start that for themselves, especially in VR, because uh, they could miss something important to the that you consider important to the game by auto starting it for them and auto progressing for them. Especially auto don't auto progress; just let them manually progress. Give them the option, and that is a very common thorn that I've come across in almost every game. I think every game. I don't. I'm not even sure. 
Um, I'd have to go back and check. Seems to be a very common thing. So, opening scene auto progresses. So, end up missing the entire intro. Same thing. Um, I remembered another rose, but then forgot it again. Um, what is another thorn? Can y'all think of any thorns? If you're watching, if you're watching this later, what are some other thorns? Oh, the um, controllers. This is another very common thing. Um, troller options limited. So, and that then resulted in how to mentally translate controller buttons for my controller because it's different. And yes, in the description, there's a very, very, very small line that said better on the keyboard. Again, it's around flexibility. You want to design for flexibility in your game for many reasons. One of them is I play a lot of PC games, but I am a console gamer at heart. Again, because I have a hard time with the keyboard for multiple reasons. I have small hands, so things that are easy for normal sized adults are going to be more difficult for me because my hands are too small to make that really convoluted reach across my keyboard. And that again comes down to your, what is your design of your physical workload is going to be more for me because I'm smaller and uh, kids are smaller. I'm the size of a kid. Physically, my hands, everything. I'm the size of a kid. So I have the problems kids do as far as physical workload goes. Kids are actually bigger than me. Um, <laughs> a lot of kids are bigger than me nowadays. Um, so I had to mentally translate the controller buttons for different controllers. And so that means misclicks and slower response. I think you just need to learn how to spell that word, Microsoft. Is that, is that how you would spell misclick? I'm going to add it. Wait. I don't know. Anyway. Results in misclicks and slower response time. And then another, let's see. During the game, at the, because at the beginning it was not uh, manually progressing. Um, initial onboarding, Let's see, create design, ability to skip chapters, language is listed in their language. Let's see, is this big enough for y'all to see? Because I've got it zoomed out, I can see it, but I don't know about y'all. So that's the kind of feedback I also want is, can you even see what I'm typing? Um, I need to zoom out so I can see what all's listed quickly, but, um, so I'm thinking there, the, the learning curve. Okay. So the boss fight. So, 
The tutorial teaches basics for handling the normal forest monsters. Okay? And, but not prepared. That doesn't prepare. For a boss fight. This metal boss. Zero preparation. Um, so there is a sudden cliff like, in difficulty. Not a curve. Not a curve. It's a cliff. Um, where was that? Let's see. Yeah. Those are connected. And that's connected. Okay. Um, it's not a learning curve, it's a cliff. Not a difficulty curve. A cliff. Um, and that's one of the pillars we talked about is the flow of the game. The game flow. So all of a sudden you're in this boss fight that is going to take a ton of effort to figure out. doesn't teach like it doesn't teach the um um through trial and error so it doesn't teach um the benefit that it didn't even teach i didn't even see that um i didn't even see it how to switch, or that you can switch your spirits for different benefits. Didn't even show me that. Um, I found it. And so you have to figure out how to beat the boss through trial and error, and I don't have the patience for that because there are many other games out there that I don't have to do that with that I could be playing instead, or I could be working on something else altogether. Um, so, but the fact that they let you skip the boss fight and, to, and continue the story kept me from stopping altogether. I mean, I stopped altogether this time because, um, time. But I would have continued playing if I had time. Because I could skip the boss fight. Okay, so now that's enough. Are there any other thorns? With it? Were there any other big thorns that I can't think about? It's a relatively simple game. Fun game. Um, I didn't even mess with the challenges or anything. Maybe that would have helped. Um, don't know. Um, so now, buds are, what do we do about the thorns? What opportunities do we see? So this one is the best practice um, for a BR. Especially is, give the eye, start, start, with manual progression, you have the option to auto progress in context. But within that, you should be able to skip, you should be able to auto progress. That is best practice. And especially for VR, for XR, for all the reasons I've already mentioned. 
Um, and this one is also the same solution there. And on here, heat body copy, narrow, and that's about, um, and I don't know what that translates to in centimeters or meters for unity, but it is, or in the unity UI though, I can't remember if it's in centimeters or pixels, but it's about 600 to 800. This is the best practice for the web. Uh, Six to eight hundred pixels wide. Crazy scannability. And this one's obvious is give give more flexibility in controller options. Okay, and then consider ways to prepare players for complicated boss fights. Like, smooth out that, smooth out the difficulty curve and a learning curve um add this to the tutorial what if these are next steps so and then Was, uh, there was something else. What was it? I can't think of it right now. I thought there was something else. Well, I mean, I guess I'm going back to this whole ability to skip the chapter, to continue the story. I like that they did that, actually, because it keeps you from rage quitting the game if you don't want to deal with having to figure out how to beat the boss. That's good. That gives you more flexibility, gives more people the ability to play the game. So these buds then, the green ones, are... So you see here, by doing it this way, you have a very clear list. And you've got the connectors are benefiting you by letting you cross-reference back to thoughts. So very clear list. These are the good things. We like these things. We don't want to change these things. These are the things we want to change. These are the things that need to be fixed in some way. And then the buds are these are our next steps in fixing these things some of these things will require research some of these things will require simple design changes some of these things well seemingly simple um seemingly simple because the translation of a different language sometimes uses more words so that might be a little more than simple might be a little more work than seems to fix um this is a best practice so do that and this is going to take some effort to add that tutorial but worth it unless they're just doing the fun little platformer stuff then fine um, they don't need to learn that part 
but they do if they're wanting to do challenges or boss fights. So at least let them learn it without having to dig around and accidentally find it. Okay, so then how do we... So you've got your clear list here of each of these things and you've got your clear defined list of next steps. This is why we break it out this way. Because some people will mix up the thorns and the buds quite often. And you don't want that. You want them to be very clear. This is the thing that's a problem and this is how we're going to pursue that thing. Not necessarily that you have a prescriptive bud, but it's a next step for how to get to the solution of the thing that you're wanting to work on. So translating this game into a XR game. This is a retro 2D game, 2D platformer game. Can we translate this into XR? Should we translate this into XR? Would it be better in XR? Would it be a good experience in XR? These are all things that we want to think about before we do things in XR. Or are you doing it, just doing it because it's cool? This, I think, would be fun, and it would be a good experience in XR if done well. It would create a very good sense of nostalgia to be able to do this. And there are multiple ways of doing it. But what you would want to think about Can I copy images and put them in here? Copy image. Paste image. They're unavailable on the web. <laughs> okay, fine. That's dumb. Okay. I thought you used to be able to do that on the web version. I remember being able to do that on the web version. Thought I could do that on the web version, maybe not. Anyway. So, how would we translate this into XR? Some one of the first things, one of the most important things to think about always with these games is. And I didn't have the problem with this one either because it was another 2D platformer. Motion sickness. I always consider motion sickness. It's the biggest going to be the biggest issue that you're going to have with a platformer with a immersive platformer that's the biggest thing that you're going to have to think about hands down is motion sickness and we did talk about this in the last one um, what we would do about that so Let me see, to save time, I'm going to pull that one up. So we can just talk through that. Give me a moment and I'll pull it up. It was the notes from trying to, and it's gonna apply the same thing, it's gonna apply this time. So you want to follow motion sickness best practices for XR and I have that and I will make a note to include that in the show notes. But that is the biggest thing you're going to have to think about. So here, let's look at the website. You can see on the best practices articles and the um, human factors section, we talk about motion sickness. And motion sickness is a big deal. There are a lot of things that you can do. This talks about the neuroscience behind it and why, why the best practices are there for it. And it also has some more learning options that you can go to. And I have videos about it too. 360 animation, directing attention, and there's videos for 
learning more about um, about these. And then external distractions are where we talk about, I think that's where we talk about auto progression and stuff. And that's especially something that you're wanting to think about if you're doing a, yeah, it didn't even mention auto progression uh, here, but auto progression or manual progression is very important for XR um, experiences. Manual progression. Uh, give them that power because many more distractions. Because when you're distracted from a 2D game, it's not as big a deal because all you can do is look. All you gotta do is look. But when you're in XR, when you're in a VR experience, you have to either take off the headset completely or if you have a quest you could pro possibly do pass through depending on what the distraction is but it's taking you completely out of the experience if you are distracted by something in xr in, in vr specifically um xr uh, like mixed reality and ar aren't is going to be as big of a deal as it is with virtual reality because the whole nature of the headset of a virtual reality headset is it's blocking off all of your senses often including your hearing so that the external you can't see it you can't hear it often so when something from the external distracts you you have to take all that stuff off so auto progressing something when you're in xr makes them miss the entire thing so you want them to be able stop and one of the big ways of doing that is manual progression especially They're not replaced the since all of your senses are well, all of your sensors are engaged in but, but let's see. Especially for external distractions in VR. Um, follow the best practice follow the best practices. Um for that as well for manual progression. And consider, again, whether or not you want to do a first-person platformer or a third-person platformer in XR, especially. I don't know how, well, yeah, so I'm thinking VR versus mixed reality versus augmented reality. Okay. Um, augmented reality or mixed reality is going to be a different beast, I think because you still got the real world. You still can see the real world and you're still relying on real world uh, motion, locomotion. Your locomotion in the real world is gonna still need to be real world locomotion, like walking, physical movement, because of you, of you as if you are not necessarily of any characters of the game that you're playing, but of you specifically, still needs to follow those physics of the real world. Unless, of course, you can experiment and see something really cool that I'm not seeing in my head right now. Because you can still see the real world. So, if you see yourself moving on some kind of virtual thing in mixed reality or in augmented reality, there's going to be a weird... I think there's going to be a weird psychological thing going on there that breaks the experience because you can still see the real world. It's still there. So I think with a mixed reality platform, you're probably going to more likely be doing something in third person. Um, so here, I'll write that down. Mixed reality more likely needs to be third person 
Okay. But VR. So. It's VR. Consider whether you want it to be in first person or third person. Because if it's in first person, you have a much, much greater risk of motion sickness. And then you're going to have to add a lot more mitigations to it. But you may not like those mitigations. But if it's in third person, you still need medic. You still need mitigations depending on how you do it. And we're going to start playing VR experiences to see how they've mitigated it, um, how how they've handled this. I cannot play first person platformers. I will get sick. unless there's one out there that has teleportation as an option for a platformer, which I don't really understand how that's going to make it an enjoyable platformer. I can't do it. Um, I don't know how, so there's a challenge there. How would you make an enjoyable platformer that allows for teleportation? That's, that's a challenge. Um, if you can figure that out. But if it's third person, um, I would say don't attach the camera to the character, as in your camera to the character, because that is pretty much going to end up being the same problem that you have with first person, is that you're having that artificial motion. And that artificial motion, that disconnect between you moving in the real world versus you moving in the physical world is what makes people sick, that disconnect in motion what you're seeing versus what you're feeling. So if you're doing it in third person, don't attach the camera to the character. And we have some examples of VR games that do a very good job of this in the platformers that we're going to be playing. Um, I think I have three VR games that we're going to try, different ones, and see how they handle it. I think it's three. So we will see that starting the week after next because again i am doing a workshop next week with circus stream talking about xr ux designers and xr developers working together and um then i'll pick the stream back up the following week but so if you're third person don't attach the camera to the character if you want to reduce motion sickness and let more people play your game if you don't care and you'd only want people who don't get motion sickness to play your game, you're going to be losing out on a very large target audience. But, um, yeah, sure. That's what a lot of people are doing. And there are a lot of games out there that I'm not buying for the simple fact that they don't take motion sickness into account. So I don't buy them. And there are games that I don't buy because it's not clear whether or not they take motion sickness into account. So that's another thing that you want to make sure that people are able to know up front is whether or not you're taking motion sickness into account. And that's something that you can only do. You can't assume. You have to test it. You have to test it with your target audience, not just your buddies in the studio. You have to test it with your target audience. And so if you detach the camera from the character, you can keep the player stable and that's going to, and it's not going to have a forced motion. And we'll see this in the games that we're playing. I think they all handle it this way uh, in different ways, um, but they all handle it this way. They're, it's detached from the character. And that is much, much better for people who are risk who harbors motion, motion sickness. And another thing, the cutscenes, because there were some cutscenes. Um, how do you handle those? And it was kind of simple with the 2D game because um, you stay stable. It's not moving you around in those cutscenes where you, at least I don't think it was, in those cutscenes where you um, were talking to the boss or anything, the camera was stable and it was just the characters moving. That's all you need. That is the simplest, easiest way to handle a cutscene. It's just have the characters move, not the scene. Um, and you can pay attention to Baobab. It's a very good example of how they handle their cinematic VR experiences. And I would, and I will um, include that in show notes as well. Cutscenes. 
sickness, just writing it down. Um, they mitigate motion sickness in their, they are very good cinematic features. They are fun experiences and they do a very good job of mitigating that motion sickness. So they are a good example. So study what they do and follow that. And that is all that I can think about. If, if you have any other comments, please do feel free to mention those uh, or on YouTube later. If you're watching it later, make your comments and that is it for this time. And again, I will be out. We won't be streaming next week, but it will be back the following week. So April, uh, whatever, April 7th or whatever that is, we'll be back then. So I'll see you then. Thanks for watching. If you like what you see, follow, subscribe, tell your friends, um, like, share, all that. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks for watching.